universities across the country are wrestling for distinction. And we have specific strengths, and we have a <coughs> national reputation that we're trying to build. And so the question was, should we and uh, create this kind of larger identity project that would wed research to the scholarship to the teaching that we're doing and bring about a, a, a recognizable and distinctive approach that, that is here. So we had a, a number of meetings that we went around, we talked to the distinguished professors, we talked to the residential scholars, we talked to all the institute uh, directors and, and leaders and big center leaders across, and we had three questions. The questions were, do you think we need a larger university-wide um, uh, identity to focus our research and teaching around that could make us distinctive? If yes, um, should it be planetary health? And if yes, um, where, what do you see as the shape of that? And this was a series of meetings that took place over almost a year. And actually, it was really uh, inspiring what we saw. People came together, they had a lot of feedback about what, uh, what we were trying to do. And uniformly across the board, people understood that this was actually a really significant moment in higher education. It was a really big opportunity for UVF to actually establish itself in a distinctive way. And there was a lot of support for planetary health, although the question kept, that we kept getting was, you know, what is it? Uh, <laughs> sounds great, but what, what is it? Um, and, and actually, I think what Sarah laid out is really important. This is not an initiative that comes pre-baked from the outside. I mean, a good part of what we're proposing here is not, it's not an institute. It doesn't have a strategic plan. It doesn't have a, an agenda at this point. What we have is the initiative to start thinking about what we mean by that here. Right? So we're going to spend, in events like this and others coming up across the next year, talking to each other about what this means for us, where, where we are within this larger paradigm health and ecology, the planet's future. These are all really pressing questions that are being asked everywhere. Do we have a distinctive answer? And if yes, can we mold a university around a vision of addressing the world's problems in that way? I think we can. But I think the answer, yet is, is really, at this point, is really unknown. So events like today are those stepping stones, where we sit down, we bring everyone in. This is a really great, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure I've seen an event where there's this much cross-campus representation. This is actually kind of really impressive that we have folks literally from every university here. And so this is the beginning of a conversation that we're going to have as a campus. And we're very lucky that we have experts in this that will come, come, welcome, and that we have on campus that will help guide us through it, make suggestions, and listen. Um, and as an administration, we're listening. I think we want to hear from you what this can mean to us and what it is. You know, Across the country, we're seeing small colleges close. We're seeing budget cuts, major budget cuts in public research universities. We're seeing staff cuts in public research universities. This is the most competitive higher education landscape I've ever seen. It's also the biggest set of opportunities for higher education I've ever seen. And so this is our effort to try and make that play, try and set out to do something different. And we're really excited to have you here. So Taylor is going to do our introductions, but thank you all for coming on behalf of the Provost, the President, uh, and myself. Hi, everybody. I was just thinking the same thing. Like, what an amazing cross-section of campus and campus leaders this is. Uh, that in itself is really exciting. So it's a real pleasure for me to be the one to introduce Tom Gillespie here, and I think he's just an ideal person to help us announce and launch this planetary health initiative. It's just a great choice and we're lucky to have him here at the right time for us. Um, Tom has been a leader in what we now call planetary health for a long time. He's an expert in figuring out the relationships between ecosystem change and disease dynamics, including especially zoonotic jumps of disease between species, wildlife, livestock, and us. Um, and he's been for a long time showing these links that Sarah talked about, the connections between the health of our ecosystems and the health of ourselves as humans. He actually also collaborates just incredibly widely. He's an ecologist, a disease ecologist, but collaborates with 
economists and social scientists and public health professionals and epidemiologists in really, really deep ways. He also is, just beyond being a researcher, he has helped uh, guide and shape and advise and launch a bunch of organizations that are trying to apply this knowledge in the world uh, on several continents, actually. So he works closely with CDC, with the World Health Organization, with several NGOs that, again, he works with and also has helped found. Um, and I also think just at the end of the day, his positions kind of tell the story of his um, unique perspective and incredible impact. He's the chair of the, essentially the Rubenstein School of Cable and at Emory, their environmental sciences department. He's also appointed at their public health school. He also has had an affiliation with the CDC, which is also in Atlanta for the whole time he's been there. He's director, co-director of the um, Gombe Ecosystem Health Project, which is at Gombe Stream in Tanzania. That's collaborating with uh, Jane Goodall and her institute on the health aspects of that location. Similar kind of role in Madagascar, director of um, infectious disease research at so, uh, working all over the world on science, on application, on uh, policy and action. Um, he's a very broad thinker, even though he specializes in infectious diseases, he thinks broadly about public health and planetary health. And he's also just like an incredibly friendly, fun guy to hang out with. <laughs> so, uh, I have known his work for a very long time and not met him until he arrived last night. Just great fun already. So please take some time to get to know him in addition to listening to what he has to say. And help me in welcoming Tom Gillespie. Yeah, thank you, Taylor. And, and thanks to the leadership for the invitation to be here and to be part of this really exciting moment for the University of Vermont. Um, I'm you know, going to talk to you about my little slice of planetary health. Um, which Taylor did a good job uh, summarizing. We're really thinking about human disturbance and how that relates to the zoonotic interface. Um, we deal with issues where there can be disease emergence as an outcome or chronic transmission of things that once were not thought to have a strong wildlife component, but now we're realizing do, uh, as well as cases where we're seeing the reverse, where we're seeing uh, animals that are endangered impacted by our diseases. Uh, so we look at both sides of that uh, in our work. But I want to start by talking just a little bit about the, the broader construct of planetary health. So far it's not. Uh, sure. Okay. Um, so this has gotten a lot more attention uh, in recent years. We're seeing more connectivity. Uh, between disciplines and the public is starting to see this information. Uh, the Lancet Commission, uh, in association with the Rockefeller Foundation, has helped to really push uh, this concept of planetary health forward. We had this special edition on planetary health um, about a decade ago, and we're seeing a lot of progression since this time. The general approach is that as our populations increase, now, you know, at 8 billion, um, our continued health and existence uh, as a species really depend on a healthy natural ecosystem and the interdependent uh, web of life uh, that compromises these ecosystems. But now it is working. <laughs> and so, in the sense of what planetary health is in this broad construct, uh, as a state, uh, planetary health is focused on the health of the human civilization, so thinking of all of us, uh, and the state of the natural systems on which that human civilization depends. That's what we think of when we think about the state of planetary health. I'm also going to talk about the, the definition of kind of how we approach planetary health from a research uh, construct. And so many of you are probably familiar with the term Anthropocene. Uh, it's a term that uh, you know, is, 
is embraced in some ways in terms of recognizing the, the level of impact that we've collectively had on our planet. Um, but whether or not it will be officially uh, a term is a point of current controversy. Many of you may have seen an article recently saying, no, 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 we're not going to use this. We're, we're definitely in the Holocene. So um, whether or not we use the term, the construct is really important in that it's really recognizing this process of acceleration in terms of the way in which we are using resources in unsustainable ways. Um, and then the impact of those processes, uh, where we're seeing lots of nonlinear uh, effects that impact the viability of the planet and our capacity as a species to, uh, to persist in this environment. Or even in, you know, in the most conservative terms, in, uh, maintaining a quality of life for people, whether we exist or not, but uh, making sure that we, we can do this sustainably. And so many of you have probably also heard about the construct of planetary boundaries, really recognizing where we have exceeded this global capacity. And there are a number of areas where the, the idea is that we don't yet have enough data to really say whether or not we're crossing boundaries. So there are lots of places where we need to be collecting empirical data to improve our understanding of how well or poorly we're doing in responding to these challenges. But there are areas where we know we're having big challenges uh, related to the biogeochemical flows, um, largely related to unsustainable large-scale agricultural processes, um, and then where we're seeing the loss of biodiversity and the loss of ecosystem services that are associated with this, including uh, the diversity, the genetic diversity of those, those overall ecosystems. And so there are health-related co-benefits to many aspects of uh, the natural ecosystems that we depend on. And in many cases, we're taking these for granted. Um, in, in the language that I first learned about from work done by good scientists, um, you know, these are you know, positive externalities that are, that are just not being put into the scorecard when economic decisions are being made. Um, but we feel them when they're lost. And then often the cost of trying to replicate that uh, using human technology is, is not a perfect fit uh, or is exceptionally expensive. And so these are just some of the examples of the types of environmental impacts that we create uh, through our activities and the, the related health effects that we can see downstream. And so you can see that many of the disciplines that Kirk mentioned uh, earlier and Sarah mentioned earlier in relation to where the strengths are in medicine uh, and health at the University of Vermont are related to these broad areas, um, as well as the area where I'm working with this interface with, uh, with infectious disease in, in tropical systems. And so the Planetary Health Alliance is one of the ways that we organize planetary health uh, efforts. Um, and this is, I, I don't know if Vermont is a member yet, but um, yes, so you're already a member of this, this process. And there's an annual meeting uh, that you can, uh, you can be engaged in to be more a part of this process that relates to the science and the policy of this approach. And so when we look at the approach, so we talked about the state of planetary health. When we think about the, the approach, um, it's characterized by understanding the linkages between human-caused disruption of Earth's natural systems and resulting impacts on public health. That is kind of the grand scope of this. And so everyone in the room has the capacity to contribute to, to this in some way. And having, like, as you guys were saying, everyone from across the university here today I hope that you'll stay, maybe have some more food, and talk about some of those linkages that maybe you hadn't considered in the past, and create that synergy uh, that you have so much potential for here. My, my little piece of this is the human-caused disruptions as they relate to that zoonotic interface. And we look at this dynamic at a number of sites, as I mentioned before, primarily in the tropics. 
And we have long-term research sites in Tanzania and Madagascar that I'll speak more about today. But there are a lot of other places where we've worked. So if you see a marker there, and there's, there's, if that resonates with you, things that you're doing, I'm, I'm happy to talk more about that work as well. Um, and so why the tropics? Um, we'll get into that. Uh, the, this understanding of the link between um, changing ecosystems and drivers of, uh, of land use change and the link to disease emergence has gained a lot of attention since the COVID pandemic. So these are just basically from some of the like 60 plus interviews that I did during the pandemic about this interface. Um, and it's really related to the fact that there's a recognition that emerging infectious diseases like COVID-19 um, are primarily zoonotic. And among those, the vast majority are coming from wildlife. And so wildlife will, and this is a lot of this is happening in the tropics, and we'll get into that, um, are really key here. These schematics that you see to the right are from a paper that we, we published just before the pandemic. Uh, just simply looking at the types of interactions as we enter uh, a habitat that is primary habitat for wildlife, we see opportunities for transmission across the species boundary. And similarly, when wildlife are leaving those systems and entering human-dominated systems, we can, see we can see similar opportunities for transmission to occur. Uh, but it's important to recognize that this, both, this goes both ways. And so part of our work also looks at those endangered species that are impacted when we enter, uh, enter their habitats. And we saw a lot of recognition of this in relation to the COVID pandemic as well. Fortunately, we didn't see this as a, a huge catastrophic outcome for wild primates. And that also tells us you know, how much more we need to be doing to understand how we're predicting what kind of pathogen is going to have what kind of effect. So we didn't see uh, COVID-19 impacting wild primates. As far, so far, we've only seen COVID in one wild primate, and it was a marmoset that was killed in an urban environment by being hit by a car and then tested positive on, on, uh, on, on necropsy. Uh, but we're seeing it in many deer in systems like, like we have here, and that's another one of these mysteries. Why is it showing up in deer, not showing up in wild primates, but we're seeing primates in captivity getting ill uh, from, from COVID. One of the positive outcomes of the pandemic is that we've been advocating for many of the same practices that we use to protect each other during the pandemic. Social distancing and masking as people visit endangered wild apes. And now we're actually seeing people doing this. And this, uh, this write-up in the New York Times from a year ago uh, presents some of our results showing that in both the mountain gorillas and chimpanzees, we've seen a, a dramatic reduction in respiratory disease of human origin in those populations that are frequently visited by tourists. Um, and that being related to the fact that people are following these regulations. Um, so that's, that's one silver lining of all of this. Um, there are other ways that we can see transmission with an intermediary through domesticated animals. And so I'll be talking about some of those domesticated animal interfaces as well. And there are cases where vectors can play a role in transmitting a pathogen either to people from wildlife or from people to wildlife. And then we have a lot of cases that are really complex where we can't really define a human-dominated versus a, a pristine system, and we're dealing with kind of the complexities of the mosaic. Um, and there are a lot of different ways in which, multiple pathways by which the pathogen can be transmitted. <coughs> And then, so, so emerging infectious diseases are primarily zoonotic, primarily from wildlife, and the highest risk for future events is in the tropics. So I want to take just a moment to explain why the tropics are such an important place for that future action. Um, part of this is just where the diversity of life is found. Um, so as many of you know, our best projections uh, for the diversity of eukaryotic life 
are around 9 million, but very importantly, the, the vast majority of this is yet un, um, undiscovered. So 86% remains to be described in uh, terrestrial systems, and we have even less of an understanding of the marine systems. For all of that eukaryotic life, so remember eukaryotic life does not include bacteria, does not include viruses, you have all of this you know, all these bacterial species and viral species that have niches that relate to uh, that overall biodiversity. So we have the vast majority of unknown pathogens occurring in those tropical systems in association with those unknown um, larger forms of life, eukaryotic forms of life. So that's one part of this uh, dynamic. The other is that the tropics have an... Uh, they have a, a much higher burden of, in, of environmentally mediated infectious disease compared to other systems. Uh, and that's disproportionately found in the rural tropics, both for biogeographical reasons, uh, for climatic reasons, and also for economic dynamics on the global front, uh, histories of colonialism and other factors that lead to poverty as a, as a factor in these systems. And so this is the other reason that we look at these systems not only in terms of disease of emergence, but chronically transmitted diseases that may have an underappreciated zoonotic component. Um, and so in my research group, we use mixed methods approaches to really understand where these emergence events or transmission events are occurring and what behaviors are associated with behaviors of people, behaviors of wildlife. Um, and to do this, we, we use classical epidemiological and socio-ecological survey techniques, a number of observational data collection techniques, um, spatial analyses, and various infectious disease diagnostics. Um, in all of our work, it's very important to us to learn from and support the local and indigenous cultures that we're working with. Uh, so many in our fields may you know, see there's a new call for grants in this area, and you jump on it and you know, learn as much as you can and then jump into the system. We've sometimes foregone those opportunities because we want to make sure that it's actually something that our partners want to work on, uh, that we've been invited to be part of this process, and that the, the information is not just going one way, both in terms of taking data, but also making sure we're giving back solutions. And so that, that's really been very important to us in, in our approach. So how do we do this kind of work? I had a conversation earlier today about the fact that when we're looking for disease emergence, it sometimes feels like finding a needle in a haystack. How are you going to identify that pathogen um, you know, what kind of sample size are you going to need to actually pin this down? Um, and often it's frustrating because you do a lot of surveillance and you don't find what you're looking for. Um, so one of the ways that we've gotten around this is to think about, well, what are the general ways that pathogens are transmitted? You know, there, there are just, you know, a couple of handfuls of different mechanisms by which this vast diversity of known and those unknown pathogens are going to get into us. Um, and so we've used some model systems to understand that. One of these is commensal E. coli. And so how many of you have a, uh, how many of you harbor E. coli right now? <laughs> so a few of you don't have your hands up, but the answer is yes. If you don't, we're in trouble. <laughs> the bottom line is all of us have E. coli as a commensal. It's not the one that you hear about on the news, the pathogenic forms. We all have commensal E. coli that's not doing us harm, uh, or has the capacity not to do us harm. Uh, and all of the mammals have E. coli. And so we look at this bacterium that we all have, and that all of these animals that are overlapping with us have, and we look at how similar the isolates are from that E. coli across individuals within a population, so within one species, and then in the overall community, all of the different species that are overlapping. So the people, the wildlife, the domesticated animals. 
And by doing this, we can see how similar those isolates are in relation to the type of overlap that's occurring to understand what might be leading to transmission using one of these pathways, like waterborne transmission or fecal contamination. Um, e. coli is a good model for these forms of transmission, for example. Uh, and we've used this to look at things like tourism uh, with the mountain gorillas and with the chimpanzees, as well as uh, local uh, subsistence uh, activities in relation to these species. Uh, to see what types of transmission we might see in those systems. Um, and here's an example of this. Um, this is looking at the genetic similarity of those E. coli isolates, comparing the wildlife, in this case the gorillas, the, the people, and their livestock. And what you're seeing on the axis here is the FST score, which is a, a measure of genetic distance. Uh, and so the lower that bar, the more similar that uh, isolate is to uh, the group of comparison. So if we look at the E. coli of the gorilla guides, the research field assistants, the humans from the villages, and the domesticated animals, relative to these three different types of gorilla groups, um, we can see significant differences in the similarity of um, the isolates. Uh, so basically what you're seeing is that these different gorilla groups have bacteria that uh, is either very similar to all of these different groups, outgroups, or uh, that are um, intermediate or, or uh, that are very similar. So ecotourism gorillas are gorillas that are frequently visited by tourists. Every day, people are coming into their, their system uh, and overlapping with them. They also, by chance, happen to be the gorillas that spend half their time outside of the national park sitting in the crop fields. So like any time you're looking at a natural system, there are challenges with getting the perfect setup, right? So we have to make do with reality. Uh, so these are the gorillas that get hammered with all the overlap. They're overlapping with the livestock when they're out in the, in the fields. They're overlapping with the local community. Um, they're lo overlapping with the tourists because the tourists are coming in. and as you might expect, because they have all of this overlap, they have, the, they have the E. coli isolates that are most similar to those of all of these, all of these other groups of, that they're overlapping with. Intermediately, you have the research gorilla groups. These gorillas stay within the national park. They're visited by researchers, uh, sometimes on a daily basis, but those researchers are taking greater precautions. They're wearing masks. Uh, they're wearing clothing that they, they clean and they wear a different uh, outfit into the natural system than they're wearing for other activities. Uh, and if they're defecating or urinating, they're taking precautions to reduce the risk of transmission. Uh, and then the, the, what we call wild gorilla groups are the gorillas that are not habituated. They're not being followed by people and they're only overlap with people is every five years we do a, a population-wide census to figure out if the gorilla population is increasing uh, or decreasing and what the challenges might be. And as you can see, they have the, the most distinct E. coli profiles relative to these other groups. Uh, and we see this same kind of pattern in the various systems that we've looked at where the, the overlap is the, the key factor for these types of pathogens. One of the other great things about using E. coli as a model uh, system for looking at transmission dynamics is that many of you from the medical side may know that a lot of the antimicrobial resistance that has developed, develops in the commensal E. coli. So we're, we're taking the antibiotic maybe for, for the treatment of a specific pathogen or there could be misuse of the antibiotic, uh, but in all cases that, that E. coli is experiencing that treatment. And so we see that resistance developing in the E. coli. And so we can look at that as not only a measure of resistance, selection for resistance, but also for transmission of resistant bacteria. Because we're not giving antibiotics to the wildlife in the systems that we're looking at. And so when we see resistance in their populations, it's also giving us a sense of the directionality 
of transmission. So in this case, when we look uh, at these gorilla populations, um, you can see a very low level of resistance in those wild gorillas, which actually is more or less the same level that you see in, in all wildlife that's been screened, because there are natural, natural um, levels of resistance that typically occur, and they're typically around that 4% level. Um, so if you look at Arctic foxes, polar bears, you see similar results to this. Um, and then what we're seeing is that as we increase overlap, uh, we're ending up with uh, gorillas having, uh, you know, the ecotourism gorillas having, at the time that we did this study, the highest level of resistance that we had seen in wildlife, uh, almost up to the level that we see in the livestock and the people in the system. And the resistance is in relation to the drugs that are readily available within the system. Um, and there's no appreciable resistance to uh, the antibiotics that are not uh, available in the system. And we determined this information by doing uh, surveys of both the formal and informal uh, pharmacies in the system, as well as using a tally board approach where you're, you're asking people about the antibiotics they're using. You're then showing them the tally board because in some cases they know the pill morphologically. So they, they say, oh, I take orange, black, double color. And so that you can see that up there. The problem is those morphologies often can be for multiple drugs. So they might send a friend to go get them double color, orange black, thinking they're getting a muscle relaxer and they're actually taking an antibiotic. So we've had cases like that. The other factor is that we, we have them save the wrappers because we're doing monthly surveys. Um, and then we can see not only whether you know, the medication is what they thought it was, but when was it manufactured? Where was it manufactured? Was it expired? Did they use the full term? We can really start trying to get into the mechanistics of why we're seeing resistance in that system. Okay, so model systems are one of the ways that we do this. Then once we have a sense of what might be going on in the system, we, we've established long-term platform sites to be able to look at these dynamics, not just with the models, but with uh, with actual pathogens. And so one of these sites where we've done this work is Gambe with uh, the Jane Goodall Institute. And here you'll see One Health approach, right? So many of you have probably heard about One Health, planetary health, ecosystem health. These are in many ways just different policy frameworks that we, that we put on these things. One Health can be seen by some as a subcomponent of planetary health. Um, by others, it's seen as, uh, as something distinct. But the bottom line is we're really, in all of these cases, we're dealing with the interface between the environment, us, and these other organisms that we share that environment with and can share diseases with or where it's not infectious, where we can share consequences um, in the system. And so Gambe has been an ideal place for us to do this work largely because Jane Goodall established uh, long-term behavioral research here with the chimpanzees, um, which is now beyond its 60th year, so it's the longest ongoing study of uh, chimpanzee behavior in the world, and among the, the longest term of the study of any wildlife species in the wild. Uh, along with that, um, Anton Collins established baboon research, so we have the same kind of rich data for baboons in that system. Uh, and then over the years, as Jane realized that conservation was critically important for the future of chimpanzees and other species, she developed a number of programs that work with the local communities around Gambe, uh, funded through various um, United Nations linked organizations and USAID. Uh, so we also have long-term data on community environment interaction. And this is also aligned with a lot of geospatial approaches that have been a strength of the Jane Goodall Institute and that align really well with our approaches. And then lastly, um, for more than 15 years now, we've been collecting standardized health data on those chimpanzees, baboons, um, and other primates uh, in the system. And then we've linked that to uh, understanding what's happening in the people 
and the domesticated animal uh, on a time frame of the last 12 years or so. We've also been buoyed by support from the National Science Foundation. So we've, just before the pandemic, we completed uh, new facilities at Gambe. So Gambe is quite remote. It's a, a two and a half, three hour boat ride from Kigoma, which is the regional capital, on Lake Tanganyika, so the far western side of Tanzania. But, so we're off the grid, it's a roadless area. But we have these facilities, um, and between solar and generator, we're able to do uh, quite a bit now on site. And so we have laboratories where we're doing day-to-day uh, -day surveillance for a number of target pathogens. Uh, we're able to do uh, a lot of the pathology. So when an animal dies, we're able to find out what the cause of death was quite quickly by um, working with pathologists globally uh, using video technology with the, with the microscopes. Uh, we're able to prepare the slides for the necropsy um, results in country now, which has been huge in terms of any of you that have tried to look at things with endangered species know the challenge of transporting materials like tissues of an endangered species across international boundaries. So this lets us get more or less immediate results. So as animals are dying, we're figuring out cause of death, both diagnostically, if it's infectious, as well as pathologically. Um, so this has been really important for us. And this is just a snapshot of what we're seeing in terms of some of the bacterial pathogens in the system. Um, and looking at those across species that overlap. So we have dogs, goats, and sheep in the system. Cattle are not historically part of the dynamic here. Um, and then we have baboons, and then Matumba Kasakela are locations but for chimpanzees. And then down on the bottom we have humans in those same locations as well as Mongongo, which is a fishing village where the goats, dogs, and sheep are located as well. But what you're seeing is that we're seeing an appreciable uh, amount of salmonella in uh, a number of these mammalian species, with the exception of dogs. Uh, and then ETEC is a pathogenic form of E. coli. So that's not the one that we all have in this room, hopefully. Um, but another pathogenic form, again, we find uniformly in the system. And then Shigella, uh, many of you probably know that salmonella is a cause of bacterial dysentery. Shigella is the other major form of bacterial dysentery. Shigella is traditionally thought of as something that's coming from humans, that's going from human to human. But uh, we're seeing it in those wild primates in Gambe as well. And when we look um, uh, using um, whole genome sequencing uh, to look at these individuals, um, we can see that uh, they're clustering across species. So we are seeing um, Shigella uh, that's closely related between uh, humans and wild primates in the system. We also look at movement patterns. So we, we integrate the spatial data with movement patterns of uh, the chimpanzees by having the trackers keep track of their location with the GPS. And then we put GPS collars on uh, the domesticated animals to look at overlap. Because when we interview people on a monthly basis and ask them, well, where does your dog go? And the usual answer is, oh, they're, they're usually around. <laughs> but when you put a GPS tracker on them, first you find that the dogs have very different patterns. There are some that just stay around, but the majority are, are covering much larger areas. Some of them are entering the national park. Some of them are going to uh, areas that the chimpanzees and baboons come out of the park to, to raid crops like papaya <coughs> and sugarcane. Um, and then with the goats and sheep, we see a lot more incursion into the national park seasonally when parts of the park are burned and when there's new growth there. And then in other seasons, in the areas where there are these places where the animals, wildlife, are coming out of the park um, to crop raid. So we've done the similar work that we've done in that system in Uganda that I talked to you earlier about, looking at antimicrobial resistance. Um, this, uh, when, when we published this work, 
It actually caught the attention of the World Economic Forum, and this was a huge opportunity. They were you know, talking about the fact that we need to be talking more about natural capital, uh, some of the things that the Gund Institute has been working on for years, uh, as we think about economic decisions globally. And one of the outcomes of this is that I was uh, brought to the, to the forum in Davos to speak along with the chair of finance for the University of Zurich about some of these things that happen in this interface and why we need to be considering biodiversity ecosystem services as large-scale global decisions are being made. In the, in the system at Gambe, Gambe itself is just this little park up here on Lake Tanganyika. You can see all of the activity, the human activity around that national park. Uh, but then you can see in the larger landscape, there are, there are areas that are still forest dominated. Um, and there are chimpanzee populations that are moving through this uh, village landscape uh, between these areas. And so we've, we're, we're using the data from our studies to help work with the government on managing land use in the region and also looking at some of the new challenges that are happening in the area, partially because of climate change. So we're seeing cattle coming into this region from the east. So as climate change has dried those areas, made them less viable for pastoralists, they're shifting into this region, which has traditionally been more linked to fisheries. And uh, we're seeing conflict between the cultures. There's, uh, there's cultural conflict. But we're also seeing these novel interactions between wildlife. These are camera trap images taken in, in five minute succession uh, in the same place. So you're seeing the level of spatial overlap between these chimpanzees, um, dogs, and people, which they've long had overlap with, but now with appreciable numbers of cattle as well. So we're starting to look at that, that process as well. Another long-term platform site that for us has been uh, Ifanadine District in Madagascar, working with Center Val Bio, which is a long-term um, uh, research site uh, that, that's in southeastern Madagascar in the rainforest. Um, Maya Moore, who many of you know, uh, was the director at the site for, for many years before coming here to do her PhD. Um, and we've had some amazing adventures uh, in this system. Uh, it's a very challenging environment to work in in many ways, but there's been incredible infrastructure put into place. And because of the long-term relationship between the center and the local communities, there's a trust that has allowed for, for amazing work to be done, both to bring the communities what they want and what they need, as well as to better understand the, the health co-benefits in these systems and how maintaining this biosphere reserve um, and the ecosystem services associated with it has been so important for, uh, for people. And so in this system, like all of our systems, we have to bring together people with a lot of different skill sets. So this is just showing um, the people I'm bringing from my institution, from Emory, to be part of these, these types of projects. Um, and so you can see the kinds of degrees here. So we're bringing people from public health, from medicine, um, from ecology, from nursing, uh, geography, anthropology, and you can also see quite a few people that are cross-trained. So they're able to kind of speak the language across these fields. Um, and this has been a big part of our effort uh, between the CDC and Emory to create cross-trained individuals who can contribute to planetary health. And as we see in the system in Tanzania, we have cases where overlap is linked to uh, disease transmission. In this case, we're looking at Entamoeba histolytica, uh, continuing with that theme of dysentery. This is the amoebic form of dysentery. Uh, and again, we're seeing it in endangered species that are overlapping with people, as well as mouse lemurs, which are not doing 
as poorly. They're, they're able to persist in, in human-dominated systems in many cases. But the thing that they have in common with the more the critically endangered bamboo lemurs is that they're coming to the ground. The terrestriality is really important for their exposure to this form of amoebic dysentery. I think maybe I'm going to skip this for time. Um, but basically, because of the infrastructure, we've been able to do a lot of unique things in this system. Uh, we've also done a lot of work beyond the long-term projects uh, with postdocs and PhD students. One of the things that we've been doing very recently that we're excited about is looking at multi-host, multi-pathogen dynamics in bats in Costa Rica. So looking at bats across cave sites. Um, a subset of that is looking at vampire bats. And there we're able to see some really interesting differences in their microbiome and their immune function, depending on where they're getting their blood meal. So if they're feeding on wildlife, they have much better immunity and a distinct microbiome than when they shift to cattle. Cattle are the easy option once the forest is gone. It's a large animal you can come to night after night and get your required blood meal. Um, but it's affecting their immune function. And the reason that matters, there are a lot of things that are bat-borne, but one of the ones that we've been looking at is uh, rabies. And many of you probably know that Rabies has effectively been dealt with in Latin America through the dog vaccination programs. The problem is now, as deforestation for cattle production is leading to uh, a, loss of, a loss of forest and a high density of cattle, the vampire bats are shifting to that cattle-based diet, and now we have a vampire bat-cow uh, cycle that is keeping rabies alive and well in these systems. And this paper, which we have coming out next month in Emerging Infectious Diseases, is looking at just the frequency, um, the increasing frequency of these outbreaks in cattle uh, in relation to deforestation. And what's important about this is that with those cattle uh, cases, we also see occasional human cases. And what's maybe not uh, apparent is that governments usually, when something like this happens, turn to culling. They say, well, the bats are the problem, let's get rid of the bats. What they found when they started culling bats in response to this in countries in Latin America is that then the young bats who are not out there are actually not learning the proper way to hunt, and they're seeing more human bites and more human rabies cases because the inexperienced bats are basically going rogue without instruction. <laughs> so it's, even though it may seem intuitive, the bats are the problem, call the bats, that's not what the data is showing. The data is showing you don't want to do that. <laughs> uh, so those are a few examples of the kind of empirical work we're doing on the ground. We work with, uh, with modelers to take this empirical data uh, and to scale it up, to look at where we might see spillover uh, and what factors we need to be considering. Um, through some of those efforts, uh, we've identified key linkages with things like hantavirus, loss of fever, Ebola, um, and other, other pathogens, uh, and land use change, uh, especially deforestation in the tropics. And then building on this, Carlson et al. Uh, published uh, a large-scale meta-analysis a couple of years ago. And based on the, the findings of that study, most emerging infectious disease events are going to happen in the next 20 years under a business-as-usual scenario. And the key issue here is many of us are very focused on climate and climate change. But if we don't deal with land use change with the same level of urgency, we're, we're in big trouble in relation to disease emergence. So people talk about what will be the next COVID-19. Um, the data is telling us it's all of these things are coming down unless we really start changing how we're making decisions about larger scale land use in the tropics. Uh, the good news is there are a few drivers of the key deforestation issues in the tropics uh, with cattle production, oil palm, and soy being the big ones. Uh, and for soy, that's also very much linked to uh, animal production, uh, because most of that is being fed to chickens and pigs. 
So when we look at what the drivers are, um, global consumption of beef, poultry, and to a lesser extent, uh, uh, pigs, is, is key to this. One of the uh, papers that's come out recently that really points to the fact that it's a no-brainer, that we need to be rethinking how we do this, uh, was inspired by gun uh, approaches. And uh, that's really looking at the fact that the, the cost to reduce spillover from uh, <coughs> livestock and the fact that that's very much linked to deforestation, the numbers are here in, in the millions. And then in the billions, when we look at the forest loss, so millions for kind of improving biosecurity, billions for reducing forest loss, but the actual damages, if we don't do this, are in the trillions. So order of magnitude levels of benefit for being precautionary in our approach. So now I'm gonna kind of for the final moments, uh, just talk about how we transfer this to policy. Um, so I'm part of, I'm an external expert to the high level political forum on sustainable development. Uh, this is the body within the UN that actually pushes the sustainable development goals to implement them and uh, to work toward their success. And my, my charge is really building synergy for solutions to simultaneously prevent pandemics mitigate climate change and preserve biodiversity. So I get called into a lot of fora to discuss these things. I contribute to a lot of different uh, reports and workshops for different international bodies. Um, and it's really important to get these bodies to work together. So, you know, we've done this with uh, IPBS to have a special, um, uh, a special workshop on biodiversity and pandemics. And then um, this report, uh, which UNEP did in collaboration uh, with Hillary. Um, so, you know, getting people from the, the animal production side of things uh, to also be talking to people within the preservation of natural systems side of things on these issues. We've also had a number of diplomatic uh, fora. So, we did a lot of these online during the pandemic, but this was an opportunity where members of the diplomatic community would come together, I would give a brief uh, overview of some of the issues, and then there'd be lots of time for questions and thinking about how this could benefit uh, what they're doing in their country or collaborations between countries. And then another thing that we were able to do through uh, another branch of the United Nations, through UNESCO, is create a, um, a film called Making Pandemics, really looking at the linkages between biodiversity loss and pandemics, bio, biodiversity loss and disease emergence. Uh, we filmed this in six countries, including Madagascar, and uh, we brought Juliette Minoche with us, a famous French actress, who uh, is a, a UN Goodwill Ambassador, and she provided an amazing bridge. Um, Dr. Ernesto Mendez. Uh, professor of Agroecology and Environmental Studies, and he's the faculty director of the Institute for Agroecology. And now we're going to be followed by Dr. Kate Tracy, Professor of Medicine and the C Senior Associate Dean for Research in the Marner College of Medicine, and the Director of Research for the UVM Health Network. So, uh, Ernesto, I'll bring you off first. Good afternoon, everybody. Do we need a stretch? <laughs> Breathe in. <laughs> Just some did say some things that weren't all that cheerful. Thank you, Jira, for our help. So, first, thank you so much for the provost office and the office of research for the invitation. I'm here representing the UVM Institute for Agroecology. We aim to co-create and co-develop food systems, transform them so that they are more equitable and also sustainable. And we release through cross-disciplinary and participatory action research, co-learning, outreach, and community engagement. 
So these are aspirations that we have, right? It's not easy to do, but they do strongly align with the planet theory health framework. And more generally, I think that we share a focus to understand all those interrelationships and complementarities that lead us to healthy people, healthy agricultural systems, healthy food systems in a healthy plan. More specifically, I want to talk today about two programs that I think strongly align with the Planetary Health Initiative. And the first one that I will mention is a new and growing program on contemplative practices for transformative agroecology. This effort is seeking to support and strengthen inner capacities of all the people that are working in the food system and here it is important to mention from the farm, from the farm worker, to the consumer, to the people, everybody. I'm talking about everybody, trying to be very inclusive. Um, and to bring these contemplative practices that are grounded in self-reflection, interconnectedness, and compassion. So going back to some of the things you said, I think we are seeing in our in small institute, but also with our, all our collaborators, the importance of taking care of ourselves, taking care of our relationships with other people and with the planet. Examples of these practices include meditation, deeper connections to indigenous knowledge, deeper connections to nature, and many others. And at the core, these practices are encouraging us to take care of ourselves, relationships with others, and, and at the end, a relationship with the planet. And in this initiative, we are collaborating right now with the Conscious Food Systems Alliance, which is a UN program. Also with the Garrison Institute, um, with Steve Postner, who was at Gandhi. And he is now leading the Planetary Health Program at Garrison. And also more recently with the Osher Institute here at UVM. And I see them all represented. <laughs> The second area of work that is I, I consider with in very strong alignment with Planetary Health Initiative is our Agroecology, Nature and Health program. And this program is led by research professor Carlos Andres Gallos Rio Frio and PhD candidate Amaya Carrasco, who are here in the room too. Sorry to put you on the spot. Um, and this initiative examines the interactions among agroecology, public health, nutrition, and behavioral science. Carlos Andres and Amaya are both from Ecuador, and most of their work has been in the South American and the Andes, more specifically in Bolivia and Ecuador. And I believe that they are directly incorporating both One Health and Planetary Health concepts in their work. Um, and I will mention also that more recently they are exploring how to bring some of this work to Vermont, specifically working with BIPOC communities. And Carrie only gave me three minutes, so that's all I'm going to say. But I just want to end by saying we are really excited about this initiative, and mostly because it is really opening, fostering, supporting transdisciplinary collaboration across the university. And we're really, really looking forward as the Institute for Agroecology to working with all of you on this. Thank you, Rick. Can you go from on that to an on that? So, so thank you for the opportunity to, to be here this afternoon and speak very briefly. Um, I'd like to give a shout out to those graduate students who did the free one at the thesis thing this week. They terrified me to carry such a one slide. So I have to shout out to our community for being great in that. I'm here representing the College of Medicine and a lot of the great research um, in health space here on the campus. And one of the things, so I, I joined UVM just a little over a year ago at the University of Maryland for my career. And one of the things I noticed right away was the enormous amount of expertise that we have for looking at things like planetary health. We have such an embarrassing abundance of expertise in all of the spaces that I think we be with throughout the uh, wonderful talk. So, you know, it was difficult to decide sort of like what do I highlight out to college. Um, so I, I thought I sort of went to a framework. Really the College of Medicine and the biomedical research enterprise here are well positioned to help them inform any kind of research project that looks at the health impacts of climate change. 
the interventions and prevention strategies that we might do to address the impact of climate change on health. Um, we're here to promote sort of the evidence base for sustained practice in the intervening on climate change and health and to inform policy and ultimately to come up with evidence based solutions that can be implemented. And I'd only been here a couple of months last spring and Meredith Niles reached out to me and she said, you know, hey, do you think we should go after this opportunity planning grant? I was trying to find my steam leg at that point and was like, well, sure, you can talk about that. Um, and over a couple of months, Meredith and Taylor had gotten met to talk about what would be the value, how could this get have a lot of the experience, diversity, and could we coalesce a group of folks to work across college boundaries, just plan downgrades, and so on. And so in that solution space, we actually came together last fall um, and speaking building teams, how do you quickly build a team that could come to the and let the children merge proposal. Um, I was lucky enough to be able to tap some wonderful folks who were in the Marine, Kai, Eric Nile, Eric Stein, Jim Hardy, um, Paige, I know Paige Brochu was taken over the session. I like the flat was part of that team and we came together very quickly. Um, and put together a really strong proposal to establish the Vermont Center for Climate Change and Healthy Mats in rural places. So this is part of the NIEHS funding mechanism to establish 17 funded centers um, that will do the planning work to establish these centers around the country. And we think they have a particularly unique perspective to offer as it relates to a part of the world population, part particularly at risk um, in the U.S. Um, and one of the things that sometimes gets lost over, we pay a lot of attention to this big catastrophic disruptive events like floods and then the impact that that has, and those are important. Um, but we have a unique opportunity as a small state that has a single um, health network. So look at what is the slowing speed of climate change chronically on even health. Um, and just um, earlier this week, and actually for the first time I got to meet, uh, Dr. Rick Warren and he and a group of people are also coming together to vote on added children. So we are also going to love the Vermont Children's Health Insurance Program. Um, Rick, did you say it was 25 or here it's worth of health data on it? It's probably 30 now. 30 now um, is the time that we can see. Um, <laughs> so I'm to be able to ask some really unique questions about um, as the climate has changed over the last 25 to 30 years, how is that showing up in the, in the health for the community often? So, you know, as someone who spent us for academic life and adult life in Central Maryland, the regular four major academic health centers, all time week overlapping, I think it is amazing to be Vermont and to have this wonderful national library for it. And it's our state and this wonderful flagship university to lead forward this effort to look at the impacts on entire health and specifically in climate change. Base. So, if any of the opportunity to tell us about that, I don't mean to shortchange anybody, it's not very important research that's getting done, but this is where we wanted to plant the flag. Um, now I'm invited. Thank you to both of you. I think this is actually a great time to plug this, but there's this period of silence and we have to edit out while the live. This is my life. I'm just going to get word out for it. Here we go. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm so sorry I couldn't be there with you today to hear the inspiring words of Dr. Gillespie. And thank you to Kirk and Sarah for taking the lead in my absence. <clears throat> we started the UVM Planetary Health Conversation about 18 months ago in October of 2022, and it has inspired both collaboration and action since that time. I'm delighted to share with you now what's next for planetary health at UVM across a number of dimensions, including research, education, policy, and outreach. On this Monday, April 22nd, I hope you will join me in the Grand Maple Ballroom from 9 to 10 a.m. as we will have several campus partners there to introduce planetary health at UVM to a broader campus audience. We'll also engage in an interactive exercise that illustrates the inextricable link between human well-being and the health of the environment. Explore explores the planetary health concept 
and allows participants to think creatively about its expression here at UPN. We have several major grants that are in development to support planetary health efforts, and we are establishing the Journal of Planetary Health, which will be published by the University of Vermont Press. Our spousal and Henderson faculty hires are being used to build planetary health capacity across our schools and colleges, in addition to the hires that chairs and deans are making in these areas. Our UVM GO program for new first year students has introduced planetary health as a theme in many of its activities. And the Patrick Leahy Honors College will launch a planetary health course this fall. As well, the School of the Arts is developing curriculum in art and health. And our university campus comprehensive sustainability plan and our comprehensive inclusive excellence action plans both include specific actions in support of this initiative. As well, the Leahy Institute of Rural Partnerships is refining its grant program to include areas in planetary health. And we are developing a communication plan to truly keep our community informed about education, research, and policy activities that will be going on over the next year. And we're developing our outcomes and ways to measure success. So more to come on both of those areas. Next October, we're going to formally launch the UVM Planetary Health Initiative in collaboration with the Osher Center's Planetary Health Summit. They will be inviting all 11 Osher centers from across the world, and we will also invite community partners and leaders from across the state to attend to be part of this formal launch of our initiative. Finally, I'm really pleased to be able to announce that in addition to the millions of dollars we have already invested in planetary, planetary health, and in addition to the funding that we will be redefining and reallocating to support our planetary health effort, my office will be investing approximately 225000 per year for the next five years to provide support for at least two postdocs per year and a seed funding for proof of concept and other initial applications for cross-college grant activity. This funding will be awarded through a competitive process and we'll share more information on this um, soon, so be on the lookout. So clearly, planetary health has caught fire and catamounts from all corners of campus are finding ways to engage whether it's from the classics, the languages, uh, history, I'm hearing from many faculty about ways they see that they have a role in this effort. Focusing our effort and expertise on planetary health provides the University of Vermont with a tremendous opportunity to do several things. One, to compete for funding in this area, to attract donors who really want to make a difference in a big way, to provide our students with a relevant and empowering educational experience, and to live our university's commitment to environmental and social responsibility, as well as to fulfill our land grant mission, and certainly to further distinguish the University of Vermont. I want to thank you all so much for being there. I'm so sorry I could not be there with you. I'm here at the University of Wisconsin. I will be back on Monday and hope to see you there. And I look forward to working with you to advance our commitment to both people and planet across the state, the region, and the world. Thank you. All right. Um, will that um, actually end the floppy part of the presentation? Um, but we do have time for some questions for, um, if you have additional questions for Dr. Gillespie, I'm sure he'll be happy to answer them now. For myself, for Kirk. Kirk? Sutton. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I will just uh, open it up to any questions that you might have. This is a sort of a question and comment for everyone, but I was inspired, Dr. Gillespie, by a comment you made in your talk about creating cross-trained individuals in planetary health, and that really excited me. So I'm Bernice Garnett. I sit in the College of Education and Social Services here at UVM, but I also have a, a secondary appointment in the College of Nursing and Health Sciences, background in public health. And what sh struck me is the picture of all the different disciplines that you were marked on. 
And I'm wondering, in your own institutional experience at Emory, and this is also for other folks in the room, what do you think are key institutional levers to support interdisciplinary engagement with planetary health, particularly for the disciplines that we might not immediately connect to this idea? Education and social work and counseling and human development, which are the disciplines in my college, really been not part of this conversation yet. And I'm excited to think through with Institute of Agroecology folks and other folks here ways that UVM can embrace this in a holistic, interdisciplinary way. And so I'm wondering what have what's worked for you? What do you think UVM has to be really thoughtful and intentional about as we go forward? So one one thing that's been really effective for us has been that we have PhD programs that span the university. Yeah. And so you can have co-advisors that are coming from two very fields who have built you know, collaborations together and there's a way in which really student can be cross-trained in the moment in that process. Um, the other is through things like our MD PhD program. Uh, we have several programs where you can get joint degrees so that you're getting that sometimes sequentially, sometimes collectively. But because we have various initiatives uh, for C grants to really promote team building, mm -hmm. uh, that, that helps a lot. So the, the former director of the CDC was recruited at Emory to be the vice president for health. And that was part of, that's why I moved to Emory as part of that recruitment process. Um, bringing people into Emory who would be interlinking with the CDC in fields that traditionally were not strongly represented, like geography, mm -hmm. anthropology, ecology, economics, mm -hmm. um, and then explicitly cross trade people as part of that process, um, where they might work with a, a very siloed group at CDC because it, it, we were trying to shape that up a bit, right? So um, they'd work with them the silo, and then the mentors had sort of a, a license to move between silos, which, you know, wasn't always easy. People sometimes don't want those walls let go. But um, now we're, you know, 15 years past the start of that, and now we've embedded a lot of those alumni within the CDC. There's now, you know, offices within the CDC with a focus in some of these areas that didn't even exist as an area for so. Um, so I think being able to have programs where the student is not put at a disadvantage from having co-advisors across campus so that it's sort of two masters with different mandates, that, I think that's key. Um, and then they kind of see programs that encourage team members being from the different like So for us, we set that up through the Global Health Institute. You're, you had to have at least three of the members from different schools. Oh. Thank you. I'll follow up add to that that um, there's a lot of opportunities for collaboration in the Catacomb core curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, and so if we can be pulling faculty members together to be thinking about interdisciplinary courses for our undergraduates, it also forces those faculty members to really talk to each other and, and figure out the common language at their complementary expertise to solve problems. That's also something that you can do um, in broader impacts for funded projects, right? So going out to, into K-12 education um, and bringing the, that complementary expertise right to kids who are going to be the next generation of actors in the end. Thank you. Other questions or comments, actually? Yeah. Oh, it's okay. Oh, we can try. Tom, I did. Kind of a broadening that question, which is great. Like, you know, you've been working in Plantero for a long time. Uh, now you're visiting university, and you've got a lot of the building blocks of it, but it's sort of a blank slate. So beyond the sort of mechanisms for the, for interdisciplinary interactions, um, what in general do you think would be exciting to start with? Uh, and what would be most impactful over sort of spin this and then no, I think you have to slide. Uh, one more thing. That's within you. Yeah. Yeah. How about how do we interact with the global world of planetary health centers and centers? Jeez. 
what's the smart way to think about joining that globally? I think the one one way to kind of keep the ground running, you're already a member of the Pledge Health Alliance. Have a symposium within their meeting, their national meeting, focused on the different work at the year perceived the month. Show what you're already doing, and you'll have people reaching out, heart attack, and collaborate collaborate with the world that's already just cool. So I mean just from the interactions I've had so far, I mean, that's really perfect. And in kind of seeing at the Moon Institute of Paris, like established work that's happening where you just need to have somebody come across to Eiffel and med school, jump in. And, uh, in some cases, they already have. In the cases where they have it, I need those people. Sounds like this initiative is what helps you make that happen. It's good. Good. Um, I have a question about what, to what degree the um, possible transformation of staff involvement versus faculty and academic involvement has been part of being effective in transdisciplinary spaces that looks to be a structural challenge. I, and not for you, in, okay. in, in some places. <laughs> <laughs> not for any of you, for us. But in some places, I've heard. Really tall, so we were right. Spread. <laughs> <laughs> Right, well, we definitely get business to involve all of the constituents through the crop campus and that includes the staff. Um, I think one way that we can really describe it, not if you think about you can have itself as a job for the actions that we would like to see happen. Right, and if we can start to do that, um, we can involve everyone in our um, sustainability activities, for instance. Right, and the other pledges that UVM makes about how it's going to be changing the way that it operates in order to be able to um, improve the relationship between uh, the natural systems which we live and and the pizza there. Right, so uh, I think that that's gonna be a, a really important plank for us over the next year to develop what the key benchmarks are that we would like to hit over one, three, and five year period, and then engage the entire community. So that, I have a Russian uh, I was there when I was an undergraduate student moved in the first third study of what they was it was and it was one day paper which was a little radical and it was self uh nerd in with Z U G. I don't you know this, is there a population group? And, uh, and that was a half of the population whereas less than half of what it is, even though it's worse than that that people that get to now. Um I I noticed it. Just like this year, the, the population took, has softened for the fact, in the God. But the question is really, what's carrying the past in Europe? Of course, I think, you know, why you have them all been coming at Cynthia. And how do we, um, or the question, and how do we, uh, assuming that we do have short people prior, uh, how would we deal with the um, the built in this conception of traditional economics, and the like more people that work, every time you get more wealthy than you've gotten, the more people the better you start. And uh, yet, yeah, clearly, there's a limit. What's your view of the application of the test? And I think that's what was said. How do you think change, respond, that what more people is more is more? Well, that, that's definitely a Nobel Prize question. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not quite there. Well, you get there. <laughs> but I think uh, you hit the key point, which is what is the sort of standard of living? What do we consider adequate or a need? And decoupling it from economic growth. So France has already made statements about the degrowth, and it's an extremely unpopular thing to talk about. But it's a necessity. We're going to bring things into it. Balance. So that's that's the challenge: is kind of working through degrowth process in a way that can create greater equity globally and decouple from sort of this wealth not being linked to sustainability. Just current massive challenge. I mean, one of the things I learned through that. Uh, that uh, interface in Davos was that there are 
mechanisms actually take out insurance policies, basically, on things you don't want So you can basically bet against it. And tell the story. And, yeah, you're basically selling short on the environment. And then you have the power to go in and disrupt and then claim. So there sure, are things like that that currently exist that really need to not exist. Okay. <laughs> Brave marker or survivance. How important do you think the levers of socioeconomic inequality and socio-cultural income are? And how do you think that we can leverage those when the people with more money and more power and more, you know, ethnic um, class are some money in system? I think we, we were talking about this last night. Um, yeah, we're talking about how things have to happen, you know, small first, and then we can see it to scale. And you can joke, except in China, where they just decide to do something that happens. <laughs> yeah. uh, but then you come in with the no. athletics and, um, and so on. But I mean, I think your position to see that possibility <clears throat> that being in Vermont, like Vermont is showing that these things can happen and that you can shift the way decisions are made so that you can have common things with people and nature to a much greater extent than like what I see in Georgia for a bit. Um, and so seeing that model, seeing the model of countries like New Zealand, uh, some of the countries in the European Union, there's, there's hope to be able to see that process broad because people see that it's, it's actually viable and the quality of lives are maintained in terms of what really matters um, as we have deeply collate. I'm really sorry to bring up a follow-up question, but what if Trump gets elected and goes to or so he's carrying this thing down? I mean, some of this goes really on Trump or not Trump, with <laughs> like federal issues, like the, the big elephant in the room is the U.S. military. Like, if you think about climate yeah. and sustainability, so that's something we're not really allowed to talk about. Oh. Right. It doesn't seem to change too much the dark of security scene. Sure. Yeah, it could be even more extreme. I will also point out um, that um, on our website are the 12 principles of planetary health. You know, that was developed. It was a mock and an adaptation of a more uh, a longer <laughs> version of those principles. It was Lewis just de Rossa and someone else, I can't remember who it was, who worked on that. Um, but um, a big piece of that is um, social justice and equity um, and a very conscious um, inclusion of the potential for bias and other things consequences with the search and the behavior thus. So the hope is that people will be incorporating those 12 principles into the work that they're doing and being really It's them. Oh, yeah, we are at 158. Excellent job. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you all so much for coming, and I look forward to working with all of you over the next year as we really uh, turn this into a Thanks so much.